Welcome to the live stream. Today, we're going over any and all questions regarding the federal hiring process, usajobs.gov. Any questions you have about getting a federal government job, feel free to ask those. First, we're going to look at the previously submitted questions that came in, and then I'll look in the chat and see if we have any questions in there. So the first question that we have is Jeremiah Givens, 7935, asks, if I've been with an agency for only six months, Am I able to move to another agency without waiting a year? And the answer is yes. You are never obligated to stay with that one particular federal agency. Now, keep in mind also that when someone's applying for a federal government job, typically they're applying multiple times. So if you accept a GS-11, let's say at the VA, and then six months later, you realize you have a GS-12 opportunity, you have an, a job offer from a GS-12, then you have to keep in mind what hiring path did you apply for? Because if you applied for open to the public and the GS-12 is also open to the public, there could be an issue. So there is something called time and grade in the federal government. And a lot of times they want you to wait 12 months time and grade before you're eligible for the next GS grade. So if you're a GS-11, they want you to wait 12 months in order to be a GS-12. So depending on how you were able to apply for that job, I know this happens a lot in VEOA. So veterans use VEOA to apply for a status position. Well, then your time and grade clock starts. So you're not able, you are bounded by those time and grade rules. You can't just jump to a GS-12. But if you have Schedule A or if you have 30% disability, then you can jump. So I know a lot of people, they like to have a range of GS grades when they're applying to get their first government job. Keep that in mind when you're accepting a job offer. But you can always, you can always, you know, decide you don't want to work there and start applying or accept another job offer as long as it doesn't interfere with the time and grade. So that would be based on your situation. Next question is from Dirty McDirt. Dirty McDirt asks, how often or how many times should you follow up after an interview to see about timeline on when a hiring decision will be made? Should you send anything after the first time and there's no response? So I would wait three weeks before sending anything. After three weeks, email the person that scheduled your interview. And also, whoever scheduled your interview, if they CC'd a bunch of people, I would just do a reply all and keep all those people on the CC line ask about a status. Has there has a status been updated regarding the hiring decision? And more often than not, they'll, they'll probably say, no, it hasn't. So if they say that, then I would wait two week intervals. So every two weeks, I would just politely email them, email them asking for a status. Okay. Next question is Jonathan LM7. And he asks... Is it helpful to tailor your resume to match the duty section of a job announcement along with specialized experience? So yeah, it's very helpful. I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to show you what he's talking about and what I'm talking about. The very first area that you should be looking at is the specialized experience. But after that, let's say, after the specialized experience, then you want to look at duties. All right, so let's just look for an analyst position. Let's look at program analyst. Okay, so you have your specialized experience section, which is right here, specialized experience. So for this job announcement, it says analyzing and evaluating programs. You want to make sure that your resume has those keywords and that you're expressing your experience utilizing those words. And then also determining program effectiveness. And that's great. That's for the GS-11 level. There's also some specialized experience for the GS-7 level. Once you've done that, if you want to give yourself a better opportunity, if you want to give yourself a higher probability of getting referred, I would go to the duty section up here. So the duty section is above the specialized experience. It's right below the actual title of the job announcement. In the duties, you will see here, it says plan, prioritize, analyze. So there could be words in here that are not in the specialized experience area, but this shows you what the person who gets this job is expected to do. So you're going to be responsible for financial management. Maybe you should speak about that, how your experience is relevant to that. This person is going to be doing dealing with contracting a bit, minor IT support a bit, maybe some timekeeping, inventory accountability. So 
I would go that that would be taking more of the deliberate approach. If this is a job, what is this? GS9, GS11, Department of Navy. If you really wanted to to give yourself the highest probability of getting this job, it's in California, then I would take that approach. I would first start with specialized experience right here. And then after that, I would move up to duties. And if you want to go further than that, you can actually go to the questionnaire. Look at the questionnaire. Sometimes those questionnaires don't necessarily match the specialized experience area. So those are the three areas I would tell you. Let's see. Where are we at? Okay. Let's remove that. Take that question down. Let's look at the chat. What do we got in the chat? Masonic 247. Can you... Can you speak about the MPWE? So that's the non-paid work experience program. How can you leverage that to get a federal job? You should do a video. There's very little information out. Okay, so with the MPWE program, I'll tell you what, let me share my screen. That is going to be for the veteran community. That will be for the veteran community. That's not it. So usually when you're talking about the non-paid work experience, you were talking about veteran readiness and employment. Here we go. So it looks something like this. You would want to get into the veteran readiness and employment. You want to apply for that. Use this VA form, 281900. Now, in order to, to be eligible for this program, there's three questions they ask you. Are you a veteran? Or are you a current service member? What is your discharge status? So as long as you have a discharge that is not dishonorable, so you can have general other than honorable, honorable, as long as you have one of those, you're going to be okay. You also need to have a service-connected disability of 10% or higher. That's something that not everybody realizes. And if you, if you are eligible, you can apply for this program. And you'll see down here, this is on the VA's website. You can see down here, right? It says non-paid work experience. They also offer on-the-job training, apprenticeship. So on non-paid work experience, what that essentially is, is that the VA is giving you a stipend. So the agency does not have to pay you. And this isn't just for federal government. This is federal government, state government, and also local government. This could be a city or a county. So you could work there, get the experience, and the VA is giving you a stipend. So essentially the agency has no risk of bringing you on board. And you being a worker there, it doesn't count towards their numbers of employees. So there's a lot of incentives if you if you are a government agency, and this helps veterans get experience. But I tell you what, I would argue that the majority of veterans, they have experience. They just don't necessarily know it. So I would look back at all the achievements that you have attained as a veteran in the military. Look back at all the awards, maybe PCS awards. Look through some of those achievements. Look through some of those bullets and pull out some of the relevant experience that you already have. But if you don't, you can sign up for VRE and the non-paid work experience program. Okay, next. Good morning, Bobcat. Good morning, Armand. I've been at the VA for six months. We were just talking about the VA. I love it. You helped me get there. I just wanted to say thank you. You're welcome. I'm glad that it worked out for you. You helped me get there with your awesome videos. That's great. All right. Next question, Frenchie's mom, good morning. In your opinion, is it easier to get on with the federal government by applying for remote jobs or non-remote jobs? Well, this is an easy one. It's easier if it's non-remote jobs because if you're applying for 100% remote work jobs, you have to know going into it that there will be hundreds, if not thousands of people from across the country that will be competing against you. And unless you have... Uh, first, you need to have a lot of experience that's relevant, in-depth, depth experience, not just surface level, depending on the job. Then you need to make sure your resume is very strongly written, uh, written. and then it also helps, you know, if uh, if you're networking. You know, these positions they're highly sought after. The majority of them. I'm speaking mainly for the 2210-0300. You can find some in the other more obscure job series that might be a little bit easier to attain. But I know for a lot of them, they're they're very competitive. Good morning, God's favor. Thanks for being back here again. Good morning, MC. Good morning, Chadford Morris from California. I know it's early there right now. Thank you for joining me. 
God's Favor has a question. How should I prepare for an interview? Should I use the STAR method of response when appropriate? Yes, absolutely. The first thing I would do when preparing for an interview, look at the agency, look at the agency's mission and vision. Go to their website, see see what's there. Try to, try to incorporate some of that in your intro. So you're going to give a quick intro. Think of it like an elevator speech, maybe 30, 30 seconds or so. You're going to tell them about you. You're going to highlight some of your skills, why it's relevant to the agency. If the agency has certain language in their mission and vision statement, I would kind of weave that through organically if you can. And then after that, you're going to give your success stories. A lot of these questions are going to be behavioral and situational. And before the interview, you're going to prepare, you should, I recommend you prepare about 10 or 12 of these success stories that speak to the keywords in the job announcement. If the job announcement is talking about evaluating program effectiveness, you need to look in your experience and say, when's the last time I evaluated program effectiveness and how did I do it? And then you write a story in star format, situation, task, action, result, or in car format, context, action, result. You write it up and then you rehearse it. I would say it. Back, I would say it to yourself. I would say it to other people when you're practicing for your interview. I would say it about 10, 11, 12 times until it's committed to memory and you can speak it. You can say it in a conversational tone. That's the level you want to get at with 10 stories. That's the best way to showcase your skills. About a time where you've evaluated data. When was the last time you looked at a spreadsheet? When, when did you identify a gap when it came to you know evaluating courses or whatever job you're trying to get into, they're going to ask you specific questions about that. They're going to score you based on your answer. So I would use STAR. Not only when appropriate, I would use STAR the vast majority of the time if you can, uh, unless the questions are, I don't know, there are some questions like, how would you describe your leadership style? You can give a success story for that, or you can say democratic persuasive or something like that. Uh, definitely when they ask you questions like describe a time where you disagreed with your coworker or your supervisor, you should have a story already written, ready to go as soon as they ask you that. All right. Next question. Good morning, Tyler Simmons. I was offered another. So I was offered another offer and I got two offers from two different agencies. Do agencies get mad at you for backing out of the, through the whole process, through the whole, through the whole TS process? I don't know if that's top secret clearance doesn't matter. Either way, no one's getting mad at you. The the human resource specialist might sigh and they might, you know, maybe they might cut their eyes or roll their eyes or whatever. But it is so normal in the federal hiring process to have people back out. There are people that accept multiple tentative job offers. And I think you should. And then when you have the best offer on the table, you go ahead and you move forward to the final offer and you onboard for that agency. There's nothing wrong with that. That happens every day. Thousands of people are doing it. You always have to serve your best interest when it comes to selecting a job offer. Even if you start working for five, six days or a week, people still, after a week of onboarding, they'll just turn around, they'll pivot, and they'll go to another agency. And nobody has any hard feelings about it. So always do what's in your best interest. Next question. Mr. Money, if you get a tentative job offer, do you have to put in your two weeks, two weeks? Because I always put in my two weeks of my government job when I got a tentative offer, but people argue that you do not need to. Mr. Money, you do not need to. There, there is no policy written. There is no regulation that stipulates you have to give any notice. You can walk in tomorrow and say, I'm out. I'm done. <laughs> I quit. You can do that. Now, is that extending professional courtesy? Is that what you want to be known as? Do you feel comfortable doing that? What is the situation exactly? If it's an emergency and you can't be there and you know you couldn't help it, so you just leave, that's understandable. If you can, if you if you have goodwill towards your supervisor and your agency, if you you know you don't mind those people, you want to you want to help them out, you're being emp empathetic, then yeah, I would give them you know some notice. But if you have, uh, if it's an abrasive, toxic environment, then perhaps they don't need that much notice or any notice. There's nothing that says you need notice. All right. Let's see. All right. Ricardo. Good morning, Ricardo. Good morning. I am a 54-year-old attorney. I recently spoke to a career coach who told me to remove the dates of my college degree and eliminate my first job experience from my resume because of ageism. Is that really an issue when applying to federal jobs? 
Ricardo, I will tell you that it's less of an issue when applying to federal jobs. The average age of a federal employee, I want to say it's 44 or 45 years old. And when you're looking at the more advanced age individuals, they are employed more so by the government. They have more of a representation in the federal government than they do in the private sector. So it's less of an issue. But I always think, like with any type of uh, stereotype, I think ageism, it exists no matter what to a certain degree. But it's less of a concern in the government. As far as removing experience, I would stick with a rule of thumb. With people that have multi-decades of experience, I would only put your last 10 years on your resume unless there's something unique about the experience from over 10 years ago that you want to highlight. If it is directly re relevant to the job. So if you're applying for a senior director position and you did some leadership stuff over 10 years ago, maybe in that case you would put it in there. As far as your your college, your university degrees, um, you don't have to put it in there. I think if you use the USA Jobs Resume Builder, there might be a spot to put it in there. But if you're creating your own resume, you do not need to include it. So yeah, if it says something like 1970s, 1980s, maybe you should consider taking it off. Okay, next question. Patricia Brown, I might be saying that name wrong. Excuse me. Good morning. How does direct hire work? Well, the first thing that you need to know about direct hire is you should type in direct hire into the USA job search. Let me just show you that really quick. For some, for some people that might not know it. Um, that's not it. Okay. Yeah. So with direct hire, let's pull this up. If you go and just type in direct hire, um, yeah, that, that'll pull up a, a bunch of job announcements. And it also says it right here, direct hire next to the position. Another area that you will see a lot of direct hire is on the urgent hire list. So with direct hire, in theory, it expedites the hiring process because it goes, the HR doesn't vet you until the end until the hiring manager has already made their selection. So the hiring manager is able to give you an interview quicker in theory. They can interview you quicker. And also direct hire is advantageous for people who are not veterans or who do not have a non-competitive hiring authority. So if you look on the right-hand side, you have veterans, you have uh, individuals with disabilities, you might have career transition. So you have people that have special hiring paths that if they're in the best qualified bucket of candidates, they they would float to the top. They would they would supersede you. In direct hire, that doesn't happen. You're kind of evaluated based on the merit that on your own merits. So you could, in theory, um, you know, get a get a government job, perhaps a little bit quicker. And then when the hiring process is going through, it should move a little bit faster. But that's how you find them. Uh, and they won't always be listed like this. You'll have to actually go into the job announcement. And sometimes they're listed underneath the job title. So look for it there also. All right. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Next question. Tyler Simmons, how can I get my security clearance process from one agency to the VA? I think you submitted a question similar to this that I was getting to, but I'll go ahead and get to it right now. If you were at an agency and you have a security clearance, you went through the process, you filled out your SF-86, everything like that, and you move agencies, that clearance doesn't necessarily transfer over. A lot of agencies, they want to do their own process when it comes to doing a background check and making sure that you're good to go. Like from the Department of Homeland Security, if you got a department or Department of Justice, if you had a clearance through that agency and you're moving to DOD, the chances are you would have to redo the clearance process. If you find yourself in a position where you had a clearance and now you're taking a job that's a public trust, that clearance would go inactive. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't, it would not be active unless you went back to that agency and then they would turn it active. It's usually 24 months. It'll stay inactive 24 months before you have to redo the clearance. And this, once again, depends on the agency that you're using it for. All right. Next question. God's favor. When you think about it, your place of employment doesn't give you two weeks when they decide to let you go. Yeah, it's true. They don't <laughs> They don't usually give you the two-week notice. Good point. All right, let's move back to the previously submitted questions. What do we have? Let's see. 
All right, we have this one. All right, Ms. Rez says, I work for the DMV office. What are my chances of getting a federal job in grade level would I start as? So working at the DMV, that's I'm assuming that's the Department of Motor Vehicles. That type of office is usually considered a state government job, and it's heavy in administration. So you could it could be relevant to a lot of different federal government jobs. As far as what grade you would start off at in the federal government, that would come down to your experience and also your location. Now, if you're in a more rural location, then you can always look at larger agencies like the SSA, the VA, and the Department of Homeland Security. They should have something out in pretty much every state. Even in the rural areas, you might be able to find something. You can always go to the post office also. That's accepted service, but that's also considered a government job. I would look in the job series handbook and look at the different job series that are out there and try to match your experience. Just knowing what I know about some DMV people, I'm thinking 0301 because there's a lot of administrative tasks that go into that. So I would start off at 0301 and maybe even 0303. You can look at that as well as a starting point, but do look at the job series handbook. All right. Next question we have is from Alex Woods, 3543, who asks, what are some in-demand certifications for the government right now? PMP, Comp, TIA+, plus, et cetera. So a good way to, to find out what certifications are in demand is really just to go to USA Jobs and search for it. So let's bring it back to USA Jobs. Where are we at? Okay. So go up here. Let's start from the very beginning. Keywords. If you're thinking about getting a certification, if you have a certification, you can type it under keywords and search and see what the demand is. Let's start off with PMP. PMP is a civilian certification or a, I guess, more of a private sector certification. So looking here, there's only 29 jobs that mention PMP. It, it's not, it's not, it's not lifeguard. Let's go down here, scroll down. Here we go. Here, project manager. So if you look down, let's search for PMP. It says right here, desired qualifications. So they would desire somebody who has a PMP, but look, they also desire somebody who has a PE, which is a lot more difficult to get. This is an engineering position. This one would be another one that would probably have PMP. Yeah, it says integrate customer requirements as defined by PMP. So it mentions PMP. Uh, you're not going to see it mentioned that often, though. If you look at the, the program management series, which is the 0340, you would see that there are more positions that do not require it than there are positions that actually require it. So here you go. This, this says right here, qualifications can be evaluated in the following areas. PMP certification. This is for a project manager, Department of Air Force. This, let me see, this should be at the 0340. I would imagine. No, no. It's at the 1101. Okay. So it's either going to be 0340 or 1101. But if you think about it, 29 based on the hundreds of 1101s. Let's look at the job series. First, let's stop at 340, which is program management. You see right here, there's over 100. There's 167 program management. And then let's look at 1101, which is business. And then you have you have 389. So out of probably 500, close to 500 jobs, 29 out of 500 actually mention it. So it's not a huge demand. Another thing you mentioned, Comp TIA. So I would just put Comp TIA, search it. There's 12 jobs. And these are going to be 2210s. So let's look at IT specialists. Comp TIA. It says in the summary section, Security plus required six months of within six months of employment, if not already obtained. So in this case, it would be good to have the security plus. Um, let's look at this one. This is mentioning four certificates. Applicants with the following certifications are highly desirable. There's four of them listed here. You have um, information system security professional, and you also have CASP plus and a couple of others. So. 12. Keep that in mind. Let's look at 2210 positions as a whole. 22 positions, 2210 positions. 
is at over 500 2210 IT positions. Out of that 500, 12 mentioned Comp TIA. So I'm not saying don't get it. If you want to get it for personal development or if you just want to have it, that's great. But if you're looking for all these job announcements to open up for you just because you have it, that might not be the case. So that's something to consider. Anytime you're pursuing a certain, and then look, let's look at another one since we have it up. Let's look at PHR because that's another one that I get sometimes. I hear people talk about PHR. So that's professional and human resources. That's mentioned three times. Let's see in what context. It says SMRMCP, SCP, or PHR, SPHR is preferred but not required. And really with HR, you're going to need to have some sort of federal experience if you want to come in at like the GS-12 and above level. Otherwise, it's going to be extremely difficult. So let's get rid of that. All right, where are we? Okay, so that, that should help you out with the certifications. Okay, next one. We have is from the Evan Anderson. How do you get interviews? I'm applying to city jobs and I did my resume to the Catherine Troutman format and I tailor my resume to keywords, but I only get referred every now and again. All right. If you're, if you're applying to city government jobs, you could potentially inquire or ask what resume format they, they prefer or ask a city employee, someone who already works for the city government and see what they're using. There might be a certain style format that they're more comfortable looking at that could potentially help you. But if you're applying to federal government jobs, then Kathy Troutman's format is, I would say it's decent and it's better than the resume builder, but there's a couple of things that I don't really like on it. And I just want to talk about it for a second. So I'm going to bring it up. I think I have it open. Let me just switch out my screens. And we're going to get into that. All right. Yeah, Kathy Troutman is a very popular book. She has a book. And then there's a resume template that they have on her site. This is an example of it. Let me see if I can make it a little bit bigger. So here's a couple of things that I would, if you're just looking at the basic Catherine Troutman resume format, when you're talking about veterans preference, I would love to see VEOA mentioned here because this is a five point veteran. This means they have a campaign medal. They went to war, but it doesn't say VEOA. And if you're a brand new HR person, maybe it would be helpful to put that you are a VEOA up here. Maybe you are VRA. So I would include your hiring pass in the upper right-hand corner. This professional profile, HR people don't typically can't do anything with this because it's not really outlining detailed experience. So I would not have it there or I would have it at the bottom. And the same thing with computer skills. How is Microsoft Word and Outlook above your actual professional experience? I don't know. I wouldn't do that. I would have it at the bottom. If you look at the professional experience, this is all good, right? You got the time, you got the salary, you got the hours, nothing wrong with that. This is good too. May contact us. Perfect. Now, Kevin Troutman, her, her format has keywords that are mentioned in the job announcement like this. These are keywords that you find. And then it speaks on it. But it speaks on it more in a responsibility tone. All of this right here is basically responsibilities because the achievements are below. And I don't really like that. I like to have the achievements up top. I want HR to be hit in the face with achievements as soon as they open the resume on the first page. In the first half of the first page, I want there to be a glowing, amazing ex uh, achievement that's relevant to the job. That's what I would like to see. These are quantified, which is great. Your responsibility, 15 officers, seven to 10 contracts. That's great. Five to six. That's good too. Now, when we get to key accomplishments, where I think it might be a little bit more important to quantify, it's not really quantified that much. It says thousands. And it says, uh, what is it? Month, months to days, which could really mean anything. But I, I mean, I get it. Uh, another thing is if you're doing your education here, I would put relevant coursework. There is no relevant coursework here. So this is a little bit older format from Kathy uh, Troutman. The, I mean, you can still get, you could become successful using this. I would use this over the USA Jobs Resume Builder. Um, but those are just a couple of points that I noticed just by looking at it. Okay, let's hide that. All right, enough about that. What do we have in the comments? Uh, Tyler Simmons. When they say it's a non-bargaining position, what do they mean? They mean that you're not going to be in the union. <laughs> they mean that 
So some positions that are you're a supervisor, you're a manager, you're a part of leadership, then you're not going to have a bargaining position. Um, you're not going to be eligible to to join the union. Um, next question. Why they don't hire the best candidates? Because the interview process doesn't evaluate the candidates. I know lots of people who are very good and technical and they have time to pass the interview. I don't necessarily, I don't really understand that question, but the objective is to hire the best candidates. Now, as an applicant, you have to get past HR. HR is essentially an obstacle for you. And most of the time they're looking at the job applications and they're looking for reasons to, to get rid of them. They're looking for reasons to whittle them away to get a smaller number that's more manageable of highly qualified candidates. Once you get past that, then you go to the hiring manager. The hiring manager is looking through who they who do they want to interview based on your job application, based on your resume. Who do I want to interview? Then they interview you. And there's a score sheet a lot of the times. This is done differently at different agencies, but the first interview could be done with your future potential coworkers and they will be asking you questions and they will put a numeric value down on a sheet to go to score your response. After that, then you could receive a second interview with your actual future supervisor and they don't have to score it, but they're giving it to you and not just you, but other people as well. And they can make a selection or they cannot make a selection. So it might not always seem like the best person is getting hired, but it's really almost impossible for you as a job applicant to know how everyone else stacks up and how they're performing. Unless it's just you are the one being interviewed and there's nobody else and they didn't pick you, which can also happen. They can republish the job announcement. One of the reasons why the hiring process takes so long. Uh, next question, God's favor. How long, in your opinion, does it take to find out whether or not you got the job? There's not a real good answer to this. I would say you can find out within a few weeks of the interview, ideally, or it could take months. There's one situation where an individual interviewed, and then two weeks later, they were informed that they had the tentative job offer. Once they accepted the job offer, the agency started having budget constraints. It was due to the, the fiscal budget and they were not, they had to freeze all hiring actions for a period of time. So four and a half months went by while the hiring process was frozen. And then after four and a half months, it resumed. And then shortly thereafter, another week or two, they started their first day. So it should, that four and a half month uh, free time where it was frozen, that shouldn't have happened. That was somewhat of an anomaly. <laughs> you know, as far as budgets go, there's always an annual budget dispute. So uh, that can come in and dramatically alter the standard timeline of a federal government job. But the, the answer I typically give people is once you start applying, if you are applying aggressively and deliberately, then it should take from your first application, and you're doing this daily, it should take four to six months on average. It can happen a lot sooner than that. It can happen in three months. It can even happen in less than three months. But there are stories where it happens at a year, over a year. So it varies a lot. It, on average, four to six months once you start applying. That, that's the answer I would give you. All right, next question. Momentum option buyer. I got interviews on December 27th. Followed up a few days back, still no answer. What does that imply? That doesn't. That doesn't apply anything because we're just in January. So you followed up with the interview. When you did that, did you reply to all or did you just reply to one person? Or was it just one person there to reply to? I would consistently every two weeks reply back. And it would be even better if there were people CC'd. So if you have more people that you can reply to, that's better. And then look at the job announcement, scroll all the way down, look at that person, see if it's the same person. Sometimes it's not the same person. If it's not the same person, include them on the CC line as well and do it every couple of weeks. Eventually, they should respond to you. So I know it can be frustrating, but it can move very slow like that oftentimes. Next question, April Powell. 
How long does it take for them to check your references? How long does it take them to select candidates for multiple positions? So it depends on how <laughs> on how backed up they are or how complacent they're being. Usually, if the after the interview takes place, you can expect them to check your references within the next week to two weeks. You can expect that. There are some agencies, and I'm, I'm mainly talking about the DOD here, the DOD sometimes will do a reference check before you even interview. Before you step in to interview, they will make every applicant do a reference check because they're trying to save time. Once they make a selection, they don't want to wait. They want to get straight to the onboarding process. So you could encounter that as well. How long does it take them to select candidates? That, I mean, that's going to come down to the reference check. So the hiring manager selects, I want to hire this individual. It goes back to HR. HR vets it to ensure, to double check that this is a legal action, meaning you do have the necessary experience that there's an educational requirement. Do you meet that? If there is a certification requirement, do you meet that? Is this a legal hire? And if it is, then they could potentially do reference checks depending if it happened beforehand or if it's happening now. And after all that's done, they will start sending you paperwork. They'll give you a tentative job offer and then they will start sending you paperwork. You'll do a credit check. You'll do um, like your standard basic background check, unless it's a clearance position. If it is a high risk or a secret security or top secret security position, it entails more paperwork and it can be longer. So then you have to wait on the security team because they're doing your fingerprints. They're scheduling you a time to take your picture. And all of that can just add days, turn into weeks, and it just ends up being a, a long process. Okay, next question. Monica, good morning, Monica. I have a final job offer for a 13 grade accepted service, but recently was referred to the hiring manager for a GS-15 at the same agency under a Schedule A. Once I'm in the 13 grade, can I move to a 15? I would say, did you apply for open to the public? If you if you did it open to a public 13 and it open to the public 15, I would say you probably could. And if it's the same agency, there is something called a 90-day rule where if you enter into a federal agency for the first 90 days, they can't move you. So they're not allowed to promote you. They're not allowed to transfer you. They're not allowed to do anything. If it is in the competitive service, you're saying that you're in the accepted service. So that wouldn't apply. So Schedule A is a non-competitive hiring authority, which means you don't have to follow the same rules as your standard competitive service stuff. So it using Schedule A, a non-competitive authority, if you qualify for GS-15, I would say, yes, you would be able to take the GS-15. Hopefully. That comes true because that is a huge jump in pay from GS-13 to GS-15. All right. Next question. Bang Fabulous. I am a former government employee and I was a competitive service during employment per SF-50. Now that I've left, does this mean when looking at the job open to, I am a former competitive employee? Yes. If you were a former government employee in the competitive service and you have done three years, and that that will be easily provable by looking at your SF-50, you have three years or more in the competitive service, you can apply once again in the competitive service. Not only that, you can search for reinstatement. Let's see if I can find it. I'm going to share my screen. So... If you look at USA Jobs, sometimes what you'll see when you're running a search on the far right-hand side, you'll see special authorities. You see there's about 2,000 jobs or so under special authorities. So let's type in reinstatement. All right, so some of these some of these jobs right here could, could mention reinstatement authority, which is what you would have. Yeah, okay. So you have reinstatement eligibility that you could potentially uh, be eligible for procedures uh, reinstatement. Let's see if we can find another one. Reinstatement eligibility. Um, yeah, so you could look under special authorities 
you could, but primarily the first thing that you're going to look is under competitive service because you have those three years. You upload your SF50, you start applying for jobs. I mean, also include open to the public. So open to the public, competitive service, and then special authorities. Run your search using those filters and you should be able to find what you're looking for. All right. What else do we got? We got some more questions. H&M, good morning. I have an interview with GSA for fraud and analyst position. I mostly have law enforcement experience and currently with the Secret Service as a computer forensic analyst. How should I interview? Well, based on your, these are assumptions, but I'm assuming they reviewed your resume and they found you to be highly qualified or best qualified. So you should go into that government interview the same way you would go into any federal government interview. You would have your success stories prepared. You would research the agency's, um, you would research the agency's mission and vision, and you would go in there and just present your value. Whatever's on that job announcement that they posted, if you if they have a job announcement for it, look through there, pull out those key words that they're looking at, probably some analytical terms in there that maybe they want you to have quantitative, qualitative experience analyzing different things. Come up with success stories that speak directly to that when you're interviewing for the GSA. So first start off looking at the GSA webpage, looking at the office that you're applying for, and then start getting some information from there. All right. Next question, Christian Andrews, any point of view how likely it is to find something in the 1300 physical science? Let's look at that. I don't know where you're located. It would help to tell me, are you willing to relocate anywhere in the country? Because if you are, that would obviously that would open up more opportunities for you. So it says 1300. Let's go ahead and bring back up USA Jobs. Let's look at 1300. Let's get rid of these filters. Anybody looking for job series, if you're not already familiar on usajobs.gov, once you bring up the page, once you search for something, you scroll all the way down and you look at series. It's right below agency. That's how you're going to find all your job series. This person is looking for 1300, I think. Let me double check. I don't want to get that wrong. Okay, 1300. So 1300, physical sciences. So this is nationwide, probably also includes places in other countries. But looking at here, the, the top one right off the bat is general physical science. You have 165 job, job opportunities there. And then scrolling down, that's the biggest one. So the job series carrying this whole thing is going to be 1301. After that, you're looking at health physics. And then, no, no, not health physics, just physics. Physics and physical health, those are the top two. And then meteorology, so these are all science-based. I'm assuming that a lot of these are going to have an educational requirement. So we see some listed as scientists. This is a direct hire for the FAA. Technical assistant, that might not have a, let's see if it has an educational requirement. So here's your qualification requirement. Um, education. Now this one doesn't have, this one doesn't have a hard educational requirement, but a lot of them that are titled scientist, I imagine they're going to have one. So this one says you need a degree in engineering. It needs to be accredited by ABIT. It needs to cover engineering. Uh, looks like this is just a bachelor's degree, though. Or if you don't have that, the degree needs to be physical science, engineering, mathematics. That includes 24 hours in physical science. So if you have the degree for it, then you could potentially get it or you could be eligible. Let me know what you're, where, what location you're in, though, because that's going to that's going to make a huge difference on how likely it is. All right. More questions. Next question. This one is for Babarkar Diallo. All right. Why do they use the star questions for 2210 job interviews? These positions are highly technical, yet interviews focus on star questions. Why? That's how the federal government... The federal government likes to ask questions that are situational or behavioral. And... Even though you're moving into a 2210 job series that could be highly technical, the hiring manager, your, your future supervisor may or may not have those technical skills. So they're trying to figure out what type of worker, what type of person, what type of experience do you have outside of technical? 
So even though the job might be advertised as IT specialist or software developer, they still want to see how your experience lines up when it comes to different situations. So largely they will continue to ask those type of questions and you can do it from a technical perspective. So if they ask you, if you're a coder, if you're a programmer and they ask you, when's the time that you disagreed with your supervisor, you can mention a time that you were coding something and the supervisor wanted it done a specific way, but you knew that if you took a different approach, it would, it would result in less bugs in the software. So you convinced your supervisor to add in certain lines of code so that there would be less bugs or less defects with the code. There's a lot of ways that you can present. You can still talk about the experience in a situational perspective by using the STAR method, even when it comes to highly technical things. It, it might not be something, mo most people don't like to go into the interview. They don't like telling these type of stories about themselves, but I would just get into the habit because once you once you've recited or practiced your success story for the twelfth time, a lot of times, just like a good story, if you ever had a time where you and your friends went out, maybe you went out to some sort of night establishment and something funny happened, and that becomes like a funny story, and you can you can recall that funny story and you can tell it to other people for their entertainment. Maybe maybe they laugh or maybe you know it breaks the ice or whatever. The same way that you view those stories, that's the approach I would use in coming up with a success story about your background, about how the time that you're able, you know, to to write this code or you're able to analyze certain information and make it a story. So, that's what I would say about that. What do we have here? Parlor, welcome. Good morning. Am I late to the chat? I'm hearing of a hiring pause. Yeah, certain agencies have been talking about they they have like a hiring freeze. This isn't agency wide. There's just certain offices that I've heard. I've heard about this in the VA. I've heard about this in uh, Department of Agriculture. I've heard about this from a lot of different apartments, but it's not agency wide. Some offices have been told to slow down with certain aspects of their hiring. And this comes down to the budget. The, bud the can was kicked on the budget until March. So hopefully in March, we can actually pass a clean budget and we won't have any of these issues. But for right now, it's kind of it's kind of rough for some of the agencies. All right. Let's go back to the questions. Previously submitted questions. Hey, we talk a lot about the federal hiring process. Federal hiring process being broke. If you don't know this right now, the government is actually offering finan a financial reward if you can fix it. So if you have a plan to fix the federal government's hiring process, and when I mean have a plan, I mean you need to write a concept paper. Paper needs to be four to 10 pages long. And you're going to write exactly how you're going to fix the federal hiring process. So instead of taking weeks, or excuse me, instead of taking months to hire somebody, if we could reduce that down to weeks, like the private sector, if you can make it a little bit more like the private sector, to have an incentive in there so that human resources can move a little bit quicker, the hiring managers can move a little quicker, Right now, for the next month until the end of February, there uh, the OMB is offering, I think I want to say over eight hundred thousand dollars. So the it's in three phases. The first phase is sixty thousand dollars. So the the top three concept papers will be awarded sixty thousand dollars a piece. It's either a person or a group. It doesn't matter how you do it, but you can apply on GSA's webpage. This challenge lasts a month. So if you have any great ideas about how to expedite, how to streamline, how to fix it, then that's your opportunity right there. And you can make money on it too. So that's a win-win. Next we have, oh, wait a minute. Stop everything. It looks like we have a super chat. Let's get this super chat up here. All right, this is from Zeke. I know Zeke's been following us for a while. Zeke. Hey, thanks for supporting me for all these months. And I appreciate the $10. I'm going to get myself a few cup of coffees with that. Hi, Armand. I'm an HRA in recruitment currently. If I decide to leave HR in the future, what job series positions would I qualify for? I currently have three plus years of human resource experience. Okay, so you're a human resource assistant in recruitment. If you wanted to leave HR, you can take the experience that you have with administration. 
So right off the bat, you could be eligible for 0301. You can look at 0301. You can look at 0303. I'm assuming since you're an HRA, you might be probably around GS9, something like that. You can look at opportunities in both of those job series. You can even look at 0343 because as a human resource assistant, you have analyzed information. You have looked into systems. So that experience would be applicable for those type of job series as well. To give you any more advice outside of those three, 0301, 0303, and 0343, I would need to look at your resume to see if you have any other type of experience that could transfer. But most people, like yourself, most people are eligible for multiple job series. It's not just one. Right now, you're in the 0200 series. So you can make a pivot in the future and jump into another job series. This happens a lot with people in the uh, 1102, the contract, the business contracting job series, the contract specialist. They, they don't end up staying very long as 1102s. They end up jumping. And even people with technical skills like 2210, at a certain point, they might jump to 0301 as well because a lot of the senior leadership positions with your deputy directors, your associate directors, a lot of those GS14, GS15 positions, they're coded differently. They're not always coded at 2210 or the technical job series. They're coded as 0301 a lot of the times. Hey, I appreciate the $10 once again. All right, let me get back to what, let me get back to the previously submitted questions. What do we got here? Okay. Next question from Parlor, Parlor 8698. Could you discuss the 90 day rule? I know someone starting at the VA to get their foot in the door. They will EOD, that means entry on, on duty, very soon, but want to find their dream position in the same agency as soon as possible. They are eligible for Schedule A disability hiring, but they were under direct hire for their current tentative job offer. If you are appointed in the competitive service, there is this 90 day requirement that we talked about where an agency cannot promote you. They can't transfer you. They can't reinstate you. They can't do anything. All right. But this is only within that agency. So if this guy is in the VA, he cannot get promoted within the VA if he's in the competitive service for the first 90 days. OPM can waive this restriction with a written request. And it doesn't apply if you are in the accepted service. So Schedule A doesn't apply. But if someone came into the VA on direct hire, that means they came in under the competitive service because direct hire is competitive service. So I would say he can do this. He can get a higher position using the Schedule A. He would have to use the Schedule A in order to get the higher position in that situation. All right, good. Next. Next question is from Mommy the Stallion who asked, when filling out job questionnaires, you are always asked if you have experience doing X, Y, and Z government jargon. If I had the civilian sector equivalent, do I answer the questions as though I've done it? So yeah, generally, yes, you would do that if you had the experience. But if they're asking you agency-specific experience, it's going to be very difficult to do that. So there are some cases where you're looking through the qualifications. And you're, here, I'll give you an example. And you know who does this more often than not? I, I keep saying DOD, but DOD does this. Let, let's go ahead and let me share my screen. Pull this up. Where is it? Is that the one? Okay. So something like this. What is this? This is a DOD position. No, this is not. All right. So that's the other one. Let me switch screens. I got too many screens up. All right. Maybe this is it. Yeah, this is Department of Navy program analysts. So if you scroll down, they might ask something here. This one doesn't do it, but sometimes in this area under qualifications, it'll talk about you have to have experience using a system. I know there was one job announcement in the Department of Air Force. They wanted you to have experience dealing with like fighter jets. Like, do you have fighter jet experience? And it was open to the public. And obviously not everybody has fighter jet experience or working on fighter jets. You wouldn't have that unless you came from that agency. Here it is. So in that case, you're not going to be able to speak to your experience. When can you say you worked on fighter jets? Unless you've done it, you can, you can never say it. <laughs> All right. So check this out. This is Department of Air Force. What do we got here? Yeah, it says they want you to have experience with weapon system development. 
Like most people don't have Western weapon system development or policies. Do you have experience with policies at the DOD? If you never worked at the DOD, why would you? And this job is solely open to the public. So for a position like that, it is going to be incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to make your experience fit that. You can apply for it. Uh, and people have. People have applied for jobs without mentioning their weapon experience in this case. But then what gets the, if they get past HR, they ask you a very similar question in the interview and they can't answer it. So, you know, I wouldn't apply for those unless you have absolutely, unless you've exhausted all options and you want to give yourself a very small percent chance of getting it, then maybe apply for it in that case. Otherwise, I wouldn't waste my time applying for those positions. All right. Next question. From O Dog, one woke O Dog. I am 55 years old, just retired from a school district with 30 years of service. That's great. I accepted a job at the VA. My plan is to work until I'm 65. How long do I have to work to qualify for insurance in retirement? Can my spouse also get insurance? Thank you. Federal employees, they're entitled to keep their health insurance, which is Federal Employment Health Benefits, F E H B. That program coverage, it extends even when you retire. So you had to be enrolled in the in the FEHB program. And the requirement is five years. It takes five years to be fully vested in a pension in the government. It takes five years for you to collect your, your health insurance. You need to be enrolled for five years preceding your retirement. And then during your retirement, you would pay the same premiums as if you were a federal employee. So that is a good benefit for a lot of people. Now, if you're a prior military or if you're a retired military, then you probably just want to stick with the VA insurance because that is a little cheaper. All right, let's look at the chat. What else we got in the chat? Um, my goodness, I missed a, quite a few chat. What is this? All right. I am Velvo. Good morning. My dad and stepmom have been in the military and government for 20 years each. Can I use them as references? You don't typically want to put family as references. I don't know your situation, but for references, I would put coworkers or past supervisors. That's who I would use as references, but not family members. Next question. Charles. Good morning, Charles. If I want you to review a resume for me, how would I go about doing that if you offer that service? I will review your resume. I have reviewed a lot of people's resumes in the past. There is, there should be a link. If there's not a link right now, there will be after the end of this live stream where you can schedule a call. I believe it's called coaching call. If you schedule a call, email me your resume or you can just send me a message on Clarity. And you could do that by clicking the link to schedule a call. Once you schedule the call, you'll be able to message me. You will email me your resume. Give me a few hours. Give me like three or four hours to look through there. Email me your resume. I'll look through there. And then during the call, it probably only takes on average, maybe 10 minutes. It'll probably take 10 minute, a 10 minute call. We'll talk about all the areas that you can improve upon your resume in order to get it into a more competitive type format. So you can do that if you're interested. The link should be down below. Um, next question, Bang, fabulous. Can you share about your one-on-one -on -one consultation service? Do you also write resumes? Okay, so one-on-one -on -one consultation. If you schedule a call, the main service that's offered there is I'm reviewing and providing feedback to your resume. I'm giving you ways that you can strengthen it. And this is done from a perspective of somebody who has edited, reviewed, re <laughs> I have written hundreds of resumes. So I'm doing it from that type of perspective. And sometimes it's a little bit direct, the feedback, like, hey, that's not going to work. Take that off. This isn't going to do you any help, things like that. So if you're interested in that, reviewing your resume, also any questions that you might have are revolving around your personal situation. What job series should I take? What hiring path am I eligible for? What strategy should I use? Any questions like that, you can schedule a call. You can get that during a call. Now, if you want me to actually edit your resume, to provide suggestions, to add comments, to rephrase things. I will do that, but that is something that I do for course members. If you sign up for the course, then I will. So the course is a lot of content, a lot of documents. You'll have example resumes. You'll have different things that can help you strengthen your resume. Throughout the course, 
is going to tell you exactly how to do it so you don't have to rely on anybody else to do it. You'll be able to do it on your own. Now, once you've done it and you have the finished product, it's completely done, you email that to me and then I will edit and I will adjust it and then I email it to you. It's a back and forth. And you can also ask questions. So that's more of a hands-on approach. That is a, that is a service that is not for everybody because a lot of people are more than competent and they have the experience to do their own resume. And I also offer resume templates where you can just do it on your own. There's nothing wrong with that. You can do it on your own. But if you want me to look at it and adjust it and, you know, completely redline it, do the edits on it, then you sign up for the course. That's how that would work. So those are the three things. The resume templates that you can download in the description, the phone call, and the course. Okay, good question. Thank you. Next question. God's favor. As an interviewer sitting on the panel, what other things are you looking for from the candidate besides great answers? There are a lot of cues talking about nonverbal communication. What hiring managers and people that are on interviews are looking for, first, they want to see how you're able to communicate, how you're able to present your value. Chances are, if you're in the interview, you've already proven that you have the right experience. Otherwise, you wouldn't have made it that far. Now they're looking, how is this person going to fit into my team? Do they seem like a person that's willing to help their teammates? Do they seem like a person that has you know positive energy, that's trying to get things accomplished, trying to learn? That's another helpful thing. I think I did a video about this. Curiosity, being curious, asking questions, meaningful questions, sounding like you're invested, that you want the office, the team to move forward in their success. If you articulate yourself in that manner, it's going to send, it's a lot more, I would say, positive energy, for lack of a better phrase, positive energy. You want to seem energetic. You want to seem like you are fully capable. You're excited about this opportunity. You have a lot of experience. You're able to communicate yourself. That's how you want to present yourself. So, you know, a lot of studies say that the majority of communication is nonverbal. And I would say that's true. How are you expressing yourself? How are you talking? Do you seem like you're serious about the role? Things like that. Now, this can vary. Obviously, it, it's going to depend a lot on the personality of the hiring manager. Um, maybe the, the the culture of the office. There are some DOD offices that are more rigid and uptight, and they like people that are more military. And then there are other offices that are completely the opposite. So it depends upon that. But if you're able to communicate your success stories and show a clear value that the agency has in picking you, picking you on the team, how that's going to move the needle. If you're able to do that, you will find more job offers than job rejections when you get to the interview stage. Okay. April, why do they call your references but ask them for their email address to send a form to fill out instead of, instead of them asking your references, the information they needed to know? Not every agency does it the same way. Some agencies will just call your references and they'll just talk to them. They'll say, hey, how did this person work for you? What do they do? How long do they work there? Okay, thank you very much. That's all we need. And they'll hang up. Other agencies, they have a process where you have to fill out a form. And, and I filled out forms for people before, but I would say most of them do not do that. They, I mean, they all have their own way of doing it. All right. Next question. Augustine. Good morning, Augustine. I really want to increase my referral rate. However, I'm not sure how. I have a law degree, not no practicing lawyer. I just interviewed for a 2800 environmental special, specialist position. My background is, and then it cut you off. Okay. Hey, in order to increase your referral rate, the only thing that's increasing your referral rate is your resume. 80% of the jobs on usajobs.gov do not require a degree. And people have lots of degrees. I have a few degrees myself, but 80% of them do not require a degree. So what matters is the experience on your resume. One thing is a person doesn't have the experience. That's going to be a barrier. That's hard to, to overcome. If you don't have the experience, you have to get the experience. But people who have been in the workforce for five to 10 to 15 years they have experience. That experience can be written in a compelling format in order to attain more referrals. A referral is simply you go into the hiring manager. 
it's not, it's not, it is an indicator of a positive thing. Something is going right, but it is not the end all be all. I mean, you still have to get the interview, but if you want to increase the referrals, you either need to have more relevant experience, or you need to take the experience that you already have and write it in a more relevant fashion that's focused on achievements. And if you do that, you will increase your referral rate. Another thing is to look at the job series you're applying for. There are certain job series that you can be found. Let's, let's put it this way. You're applying, let's say you apply for a 1700. Uh, let's say at some point in time, you taught somebody something. You Maybe you brought some paralegals in and you taught them something. You could technically be eligible for 1701, but will you be best qualified for 1701? Maybe not. Maybe 0340, which is program management, maybe you would be best qualified based on your experience for a completely different job series. You have to explore the job series and find which one, not necessarily one, because it could be two, three, four, but which ones better align with your previous experience. That's another key. All right. Next question, Nikki. Good morning, Nikki. Good morning. I was retired on disability 11 years ago as a GS11. I've been applying as a veteran hiring path. If the position doesn't require an SF50 during application, how does it affect step pay? I don't think it, it would affect step pay at all. So you are applying using a veteran hiring path. So if it doesn't include an SF-50, you don't have to include your previous SF-50. Once you're coming in, as long as there's been a 90-day break from the time that you're working a government job, if it's been 90 days since you've last held a government job, you should be able to enter into negotiation with step level. It doesn't have to be salary dependent either. It can be done on, on your own merit based on your years of achievements, of your years of experience. You can leverage that in order to get a higher step pay. You just have to... Uh, submit the memo. Okay. What else do we have? God's favor. How do you financially prepare for a government shutdown like any other unknown? Yeah, any other unknown life mishap, I assume. That's exactly right. The way that you prepare, the longest shutdown was what? I think the longest shutdown was something like six weeks. So knowing that... Knowing what has been the worst case scenario in the past, the government could be shut down for six weeks or let's just say two months. You need to have two months of living expenses. You just need to. And it could take you a long time. If you're not there already, it could take you a long time to build up to that. But it should be a goal to build up to the point where you have two months of living exp uh, expenses, whatever your salary. So if you're a GS-12 in Chicago, maybe you're making 90000 a year. Um, maybe you're making, I don't know, 4,000, 3,000 every two weeks. So 6,000, 6,000 times two is 12,000. You should have $12,000. You need to figure out what numbers make sense in your scenario based on how much pay that you're earning at whatever GS grade you're at. And you should have at least two months. That's the minimum. And maybe that doesn't happen this year, but it should be a goal. Maybe for next year, you just constantly work towards that goal until you have it. Once you have those two months, obviously you want to extend it to three months, to five months, to six months. That would be great. But at least you would have the peace of mind of knowing that if the government did shut down, it probably is not going to shut down for longer than two months. It's probably, in actuality, it'll probably be like a week or two. But if it does shut down for two months, you're covered because you could use that emergency saving and then you you would get the money back anyway as soon as the government opens up. So, you know, it just comes to, to you know, saving for an emergency like you would any emergency. You're absolutely right. Um, okay. What else do we have? Next question. I This is Jana Gibson. I have a searchable resume for grant management which has received referrals for positions I apply for, but I never receive anything from my searchable resume. Does HR use the search feature? HR uses the search feature sometimes. I have known people who were extended interviews solely based on their resume being searchable, but it usually occurs more with people that have um, skills on the urgent hire list. So if you look at urgent hire, you're looking at uh, IT special, not, not just IT, 2210 is on there, but usually you're talking about cybersecurity. If you have a compelling cybersecurity resume on Searchable, 
someone's going to be reaching out to you probably in the next few weeks. <laughs> and same thing with all the other ones. We can bring that up real quick. For some people that might not know, let's bring this up. This is USA Jobs. If you just start for USA Jobs at the very first page and you go down, you'll see Urgent Hire. This is the third tab to the right. Click that. These, these are the positions that are high in demand. These are the positions that you will usually see using direct hire. Not always, because there are some 0301s that are on direct hire, and it's not on this list. Direct hire can also be used for um, rural areas, places that people don't really want to go, and they have a hard time finding talent. But you can see, we were just talking about the sciences earlier. The sciences are on here. Cybersecurity is on here. Auditing. Human resource management is on here. Engineering. So if you have a resume in these fields, a good resume, like a strong one, written up and it's searchable, you might have more results than if you're, you know, if you just have miscellaneous program management. That might not be as much, right? So let me go back to the previous submitted questions. Get through that. We're already past the one hour mark. I want to make sure I get through all of these. Let me take that question down. Good question. All right. All right, next question. Another question from Dirty McDirt, who asks, why is the hiring process for intelligent agencies so ridiculously slow? Even when a candidate has a current clearance working in the industry and has previously worked with the other agencies, they're still trying to get a job with. I'm making it very easy for them with all qualifications, but you still can't get around sitting for months with no communication. So most intelligent community jobs, they have a clearance requirement, and that's going to be additional time to the hiring process. Even if you move from one sub-agency to another one, there could be, if the clearance requirement changes even a little bit, it could add more time. Um, but the hiring process in general for federal government jobs is held up by three things. It's held up first, it's held up by HR. Second, it's held up by the hiring manager. And then it's also held up by the security team. So that's those are the three areas that you can check in with. Well, depending on where you're at. If you're just dealing with HR, then all you're going to be able to do is, is to communicate with HR. So it's not just it's not just hiring managers either. Um, last week, I was talking to two hiring managers that were very frustrated because they wanted to hire people for their team like last year. Last March, they told HR to post a job announcement. And here we are in January, 10 months later, nine or 10 months later, that job announcement is still not on usajobs.gov. They need people desperately. They're frustrated that HR has not posted that job announcement. So they're confused. They're frustrated. They want to hire quicker. And then in other agencies, the whole situation might be reversed. It could be HR that wants to get people in and the hiring manager is actually holding them up. It will depend. They're, the culture, the work, the processes, it varies dramatically from agency to agency and even within some sub-agencies. So I, I understand that it could be confusing. Another question. Actually, before we get into this next question, go ahead and do me a huge favor and just hit the like button. I would really appreciate that. Okay, next question. Show up Simon, who asks, so unless I have a specialized resume for each job reflecting the specialized experience, my chances go down? Also, what if I do not meet the job qualifications? Should I not apply? Give me a second. All right, as we talked about earlier, your number one goal when applying to jobs is to make sure your resume speaks to the job. How do you do that? Number one, your resume should speak to the job series. Number two, it should speak to the specialized experience section in the job announcement. And number three, it should speak to the duty section in the job announcement. Nobody is making assumptions on your experience. You can put down that you, you were responsible for you know managing this one system, but if you do not spell out exactly what they're looking for, if you do not use the word that they're looking for. They're looking for someone who's evaluated effectiveness. They're looking for someone that has identified problems. 
that has quantitative experience, if you do not put the word in there, they cannot assume that you've done it. You have to put quantitative analysis. I utilized, I leveraged qualitative analysis in order to identify this issue. And then I was able to solve the problem and it resulted in a 20% effectiveness rate quarter over quarter. That, that they can understand, that they can qualify you for. If there's an audit, why did you hire Brad? Brad's not qualified. They can look at the resume and say, Brad is qualified because he put down here exactly, he had the experience this job announcement was requesting. That's why he's qualified. I'm going to pass my audit. I am compliant, 100% compliance rate. I have no worries. But if you make assumptions, you are not. You're at risk of failing an audit and you don't want to do that. So that's the reason why. Okay. What else we got? Tyler Simmons asks, hello, Armand. I had a question. I applied for a job that requires a security clearance. I was able to obtain it but did not start with that agency. If I go to, this is a job, this is a question that we answered earlier. Basically, if you have a secret clearance and you're no longer using it, it goes inactive. If you get a job that requires it again within 24 hours, it can be activated again. This will depend on the agency. If it's the same agency you left in there, there shouldn't be another background check. If it's for a new agency, potentially there could be another background check. Um, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing that you went through a clearance and you were able to get it. That means you're clearable. So you shouldn't have a doubt in the future the next time you apply for a job that has a secret security cl clearance requirement. Okay, next, next question. Ked Tag9153, if you get interviewed and then months later I get a tentative eligible and refer to the hiring manager email. I don't understand that question. But what everyone should understand is the usajobs.gov status you cannot always trust that because USA Jobs is not the one updating the status. It is the external agency's HR. They are responsible for updating the status. And sometimes they don't. Sometimes it doesn't even say people get hired and the status hasn't changed. Or you might even get a non-referral email two months later and you're working the job and you're like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so they will eventually, most of them will go back and they'll fix it. They'll fix all the statuses months later. And that's why you might get a, you were referred email. And then a few seconds later, you're not, you were not selected. And it's kind of confusing. But the whole thing is done because either the HR office was complacent. They had a high turnover rate and maybe somebody left and there was no proper cover down. For some reason, it didn't get done. Maybe they're under an audit. Maybe they're under a review and they're trying to fix it. So don't always trust the statuses that you see in usajobs.gov. All right. Let's go back to the questions. Um, all right. What is this? Money cash has a question. On average, if references are contacted, what percent chance do you have of getting hired? So this is just my opinion. But I would say, first, I want to make it clear. If you go through an interview and then they ask to check references, it's a great sign. It's a wonderful sign. I would put the odds of you actually getting hired, probably, I would want to say 70%, I would say. It could be 50%, but in my experience, it's like 70%. So it's a very good sign. There are times where they'll request the references of the top two candidates, or maybe even the top three candidates. Here's another thing. You can get plenty of jobs, even though you're not the main choice. You can get plenty of government jobs being a backup choice. Because the person that's the primary choice, a lot of times, they're someone else's primary choice too. And this isn't the first job they applied to. So they might, they might end up rejecting it. And you would be surprised how many people reject their job offers. Especially if you're taking the perspective of somebody that's trying to get into the government, you don't think about it. But there are a lot of people that when you give them a job offer, they reject it. And it's usually because they have better offers already lined up. So even if you're the number two or the number three person, you can still get plenty of jobs that way. I know some, I was talking to somebody who was discouraged earlier. They're like, I'm always the runner up. I'm always the, you know, I was, they informed her that she wasn't the primary, but she was like pretty much the alternate. But even in a situation like that, you can still get the job. So don't let it discourage you too much. 
All right. Oh, here we go. Augustine thinks, where can I go to explore job series to align it with my experience? Okay, I'm going to take you there right now. Let's go together. Let me stop that. Let me open something up and we'll go there right now. Uh, let me share my screen. So where, you, where you're going to go is you are going to the OPM job series handbook. You see how I'm Googling it right now? Do the same thing. Google OPM job series handbook. Click the first link that comes up. This is the 2018 edition. You see up here, maybe I can make it a little bit bigger. This is 2018, December. This is where you want to be because the new one is trash. Do not look at the new one. I can't stand the new one. This one is a lot more reliable in my opinion. All right, if you look through here, this is where you'll see all the job series. Now, let's say let's say you have experience with, I don't know, let's say you have experience with budgets. So hit control F, type in budget. When you do that, the first thing that pops up is the 0500 series, and that's good. But if you keep doing it, other things will pop up. So first thing is 0560. That's good. Next thing is 0561. That's an area you should look at. Next one is 0343. There could be some budget jobs in there. So put that on your list. Next thing is 0391. That could be on your list. And you just keep doing this. Whatever your experience is, type in a word. So think of an action that you've done. Is it financial management? Is it evaluate data? Is it programming? Whatever the word is, type it up here and start looking through here. Once you find a job series that you like, let's go to 560 because that's the best one for budget analysts. You click on there. You're going to be able to look and it's going to explain the job series in more detail. This is what you need to have in order to be eligible for a lot of 056. 560 positions. Uh, also, this right here, professional work involves creating, exploring, evaluating, designing solutions. You can read through this, and this guide is meant to help HR specialists um, create the position or code the position. That's accounting. So you just stick with 0560. But look through here. Spend some time here. This is going to give you insight to the job series. All right. Okay. Thank you for your time and advice. Well, thank you, Nikki. Thank you for sharing, for spending some of your time with me this morning. Oh, this person wants to know the o OMB contest. You want to know that? Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Let me, let me bring it up and I'll just share my screen. Nope. All right, all right. How many people are in the DC area? If you're in the DC area, type in DC. And if you're not, type in the state. Type in the state that you're in. Because a lot of times I just assume people are in the DC area because I talk to a lot of people in the in the DC, Maryland, Virginia area. But then I, I hear somebody from Wyoming and I'm like, what? I didn't even think about Wyoming. Um, let me just get to it. All right. Where is it? Huh. All right. Hey, I'll tell you what, I'm having some difficulties finding it. After this stream is over, I'll drop a link in the description. So check probably about 10 or 15 minutes after the stream is over. Check the description. I'll have a link to the contest if you want to check that out. All right. Next question is Cisco. Good morning, Armand. I've been working for the post office for about a year. Not sure how to apply using the interagency agreement. When you apply to a federal government job, it's going to ask you if you, well, for the vast majority of them, it will ask you if you're using an interagency agreement, you will click the button saying you're a postal worker. And that's going to send a signal that, you, um, that you're that you eligible for, for using it. So 
I would upload any type of appointment letter or any type of proof that you currently have employment with the post office, upload that as a support and documentation, and then select the right option when you're applying. It should be the first or the second screen once you apply to a job announcement. Uh, let's see, DC, Sean's from the DC. All right. I might run into you at the grocery store. Washington, Delaware. Texas, New York, California. Yeah, we got people from all over the place. New Jersey, D.C. I might see you on the train if you take the train, parlor. Virginia, Virginia. All right, Vermont, D.C. D.C., a lot of D.C. folks in here. California. Okay, great. And then we got Texas and Florida. Nice. All right. Let's see what else we got. We got any other questions? Uh, yeah. Hey, everybody, everybody, anybody out there feeling a little bit discouraged? I want to remind you to stay consistent. Um, I was talking to a guy the other day. He was so excited. He had like 15 job offers. He's like, man, the first few job offers, it took a few months to come in, but now I'm up to 15. I'm rejecting job offers. I have so many job offers. He was expressing his gratitude. Thank you so much. All this stuff. And the very first job offer, it came after like the 12th or 13th application. So if this guy, if he only applied 10 times and gave up, he wouldn't have any job offers. He would still be working at his at his old job, which was in retail. And this is often the case where a lot of times you just have to keep doing the action. And I know I say that a lot to keep doing it, keep doing it. But I'm being sincere. You need to keep doing it. You just have to keep doing the action and the results will come and it'll take It'll, sometimes it, it doesn't take weeks, but it takes months, but the results will come if you stick with it. If you have belief and conviction in your plan, in your resume, and the actions that you're taking, if you're confident in them and you should be, then you need to continue to keep with the action and you're going to get there. Uh, once again, I didn't, I didn't talk about it all stream. So I have to mention it right now. The newsletter, click the link to join the newsletter. I'm pushing out virtual hiring events every week. And there were two federal agencies that I think it was last week or this week, they didn't even mention their hiring event. It's not on USA Jobs. I had to go dig for it. And it took me about 30 to 45 minutes to dig through these websites to pull out the hiring event. I think this one was with the FDIC. I could be wrong. But if you want the virtual hiring events, if you want them delivered to your inbox so that you can just sign up and participate, meet human resource specialists, potentially meet human or hiring managers, you know, start doing some of that networking, get out there to the virtual hiring events. You could do it at your home. You could do it in your bed, on your couch, in your dining room table. It doesn't matter. Sign up to the newsletter. I also include news talking about shutdown news, agency layoffs. This person's having a hiring surge, all that type of stuff. It's in the newsletter. Go ahead and sign up to that newsletter down below. Appreciate it. I appreciate everybody for sticking with me this morning. Let me look back at the chat and see if we got anything else before we wrap this up. We got Georgia. All right. Uh, thank you from Wyoming. Thank you, Julia, for being here. Thank you, Cisco. Thank you, Teresa. God's favor. I want more in 2024. I like the way that sounds. Nikki, I applied 40 times, started two months ago. Thank you for everything you answered today. Thank you, Nikki, for being here. Aaron G14, great advice. I earned my GS position this year by using your guidance and opinions. I appreciate it. I'm glad I was able to make a small impact there. Um, once again, if you do need further assistance, there's links in the description below. Schedule a call, sign up for the course, or download some of the templates that could help you structure your resume in a more competitive format. I think there is a 0, 0300, 2210, and 0500 job series. And I might be looking to do another one, maybe 1102, maybe something in the 1100 series. I've been getting some requests of doing the 1100 series. Um, hey, good luck in all your interviews. Good luck in your, your job search. And thank you so much for being here this morning. I appreciate everybody. All right, goodbye.